thanks for tuning in. What absolutely extraordinary times we live in, times of total uncertainty. One of the things that's concerned me, if there's a concern, I feel very at peace with everything that's taking place right now. I'm very confident about who I am in Christ, where we are, and the fact that Jesus, the King of glory, is well and truly in control. Uh, it may look different to some, but I want to tell you today, right from the outset, as we begin to look at a series on end times, that we need to understand who is in total control of this universe. It's not the devil, it's not his angels, it's not the Antichrist, it's not some world system. It is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And I've, over the past few weeks, as this thing's been going on, been amazed to find that Christians are confused, uncertain. They're asking so many questions. Is this the end of the age? Is this the wind up of all things? Is this where everything comes to an end? What is going to happen? Is this the rise of the Antichrist? What about vaccines? What about this? What about that? Where do we go economically? What's going to happen? At this point, the most confident, certain place that any Christian can be is with their feet on the rock and absolutely in the word of God. Let me answer the question, are we in the end times? And it's from the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, and it says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch and pray. The end of all things is at hand. When was it written? It was written by Peter in 60 AD from Babylon. Written in 60 AD. That's a long time ago. And he says, the end of all things is at hand. I think the early church believed they were entering into end times. From the time I've been saved, we have seen and heard so much about end times, taught and put to us. Are we in the end times? What does the Bible say? We need an understanding of what the scripture says and our certainty in Christ. For the last few weeks, I have given myself solidly to a study of the book of Revelation afresh, the study of the book of Thessalonians afresh, and I've gone back into a book that I love dearly, and that is the book of Daniel. And uh, I studied the book of Daniel for hundreds of hours a few years ago to get an understanding of where we're at, where we are in the world, what's taking place. One of the most profound books that we can look at is the book of Daniel. It outlines much of what is happening, answers questions, and it ties us together with the book of Revelation. So what I want to do over these coming episodes, and I don't know how many there's going to be, but I'm going to do it until I feel that we've answered many of the questions that are being asked. I have the book of Daniel, which I want to go into. I've got the book of Revelation here, which is absolutely exciting me. And I had to get a new Bible. So this is my brand new Bible that since, and I haven't had a good break in I don't know how long. It's been numbers of years since I've actually stopped and been totally free to just get in the Word hours and hours a day. It's been wonderful for me. And I've just been in the book of Revelation again. And it is exciting me. And the book of Revelation, if you're a Christian, is the greatest book of hope you'll ever read. If you're not a Christian, it makes Freddy Krueger and the horror movies look like a Sunday school picnic. I advise you as a Christian to seriously study what God says. Get an understanding of it. The book of Revelation is not hard. If you work Daniel and Revelation together, you're going to get very clear answers. And they're going to explain so much of what's going on. We can surmise. We can come up with all sorts of things. Where are we at right now? I don't really know. Are we in the end times? I think there's a whole lot of things that point to the fact that we're a long way down the line, that the coming of Jesus is not that far away. And I think any Bible-believing Christian right now would say to you that we really are very, very close to the coming of the Lord Jesus. And I thought, Lord, where do I start in this? There's so many places we could start. And I thought a good place to start maybe would be in the book of Matthew chapter 24. I'll start there and then I'll jump across to the, the book of 
Thessalonians and have a look there. But bear with me. Go with me, please, to Matthew 24, to what is known as the Olivet Discourse. It's in three of the Gospels. You'll read it in Luke 21 and 24. They're the two key ones that people study in this area. Matthew is writing here, and this has a very strong Jewish emphasis. Very strong. And I'm going to read just a few verses here, which I think answer questions, which will get us started in a study into end times. Jesus was with his disciples, and he had just profoundly spoken and said, Yes. Well, they'd been talking about the temple and saying, look at this incredible temple. And Jesus spoke to them and he was fired up because he'd been down in the temple. He had basically told them that the glory was gone, that it was over. And the disciples are saying, what a beautiful building. And it must have been 90 feet long blocks of white marble. The most, one of the most beautiful buildings in the whole world. And Jesus spoke to me and said, yes, it is a great building. However... Not one stone of this building is going to be left on top of another. That was fulfilled exactly in 70 AD when Titus Flavius Vespasian, the Roman general, came in with his son, Titus Flavius Vespasian. We know that there was a great siege of Jerusalem. It's described, if you are a student, you've probably gone into the, the writings of Josephus and studied the wars of the Jews, in which there's a detailed description of this incredibly horrible time that took place when the temple was destroyed. Multitudes were hanging on crosses all around Jerusalem and the Romans came in. And in 70 AD, exactly as Jesus spoke, the stones were turned over to get the gold. The temple was completely destroyed. And Josephus writes and says, it seemed as though God himself wanted this to happen, wanted this temple to be destroyed. And so Jesus said, this is the prophetic thing that's coming. And they realized that he was speaking prophetically. And four of the disciples sat with him on the Mount of Olives. This is called the Olivet Discourse. And they asked him the question and he said, that, and they said to him, Lord, tell us three things they asked. When will this be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Three questions. The first one, when are these things going to be? When's the temple going to be destroyed? Number two, what will be the sign of your coming? And what are the events we should look for for the end of the age? And these are questions that really are being asked around the world right now. This is the questions that Christians are asking. Is this the end of the age? When is Jesus coming? What does it look like? How's it going to be? Where are we at? Are we going to go through great tribulation? Are we going to face all this stuff that Revelation talks about? Where do we fit into everything? Is there an Antichrist regime? Who is the Antichrist? Is there a one world system? And so on. I'm going to set out to answer those things. It says here, then, he says, firstly... Take heed, he said, that no one deceive you. Don't be deceived. Don't get caught up in a thousand things. Be caught up in what the word says. Don't be caught up by what CNN says. Don't be caught up by everything, but be taken by what the word of God says and come to an understanding in your own mind of your security, where you fit in Christ who you are in Christ. I think that's very, very significant at this time. Jesus said, firstly, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ, and they will deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumours of wars. And we're always hearing of them, always hearing about wars. We're hearing about what's going to happen with Iran, Russia removing into position, what's going on with Syria. Are the... Iranian is going to attack Israel. Is Israel what is going to take place? And we can talk much about the turmoil in the Middle East and say, well, where does that fit scripturally? We will touch that later. The Bible says you'll hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not troubled. God says, hey, don't be deceived and don't be troubled. And can I say to you today, don't be deceived and don't be troubled but be certain and be strong and get into your Bible 
and follow this stuff through. So he says you'll hear of these wars, rumours of wars, and all these things are going to come to pass. He says this is normal, this is going to come to pass. You'll hear of all these things, they come, they go, and we keep hearing about them. He says the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows or the birth pangs. These are the signs of a woman who's going into labour. If for ladies that are watching, you will understand that when the labour pains start, and I thank God that I'm a man, and the bones, the pelvis starts to move and expand, and you get the contractions, it progressively gets worse and worse, so I understand, and I thank God I'm never going to have to know experientially, but it starts slow and builds up and up. And what God is saying here is that there's the beginning of sorrows and things are going to accelerate and accelerate and accelerate. And as you read the book of Revelation and God bring, comes in with judgment in the book of Revelation, you find that it starts, well, it doesn't start slowly, but it goes and gets stronger and stronger and faster and more intense leading up to the moment when Christ in all of his glory and power is going to come and he is literally going to seize hold of his world, his earth, and take it with absolute strength and force. There's teachings today that the, earth, that the church is going to usher in Jesus' coming. My Bible says that he himself will come and tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of Almighty God. We can read that in a number of places in Revelation. We'll look there. We can go back and we can see it um, in Isaiah 63. Who is this that comes out of Basra? His robes dipped in blood. Tis I the mighty to save. I have trod the winepress of the fierce wrath of Almighty God alone. And so stuff's going to happen that's going to be very strong. But I'll say this to you. The world is very close to meeting Jesus head on. Things are closer than ever to the coming of Christ in all power, all dominion, all authority, to a degree that the days are coming where the Bible says men are going to hide in caves, the great men and the opponents of God are going to hide in caves and cry out, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the Lamb. They're going to hide out because of what's coming on the earth. I'm glad I'm a Christian. For a Christian, the book of Revelation, as I said before, is going to be uh, a, very, it's a very positive thing. If you're not a Christian, what's coming on the earth is not going to be very great at all. In fact, I would warn you to get right with Jesus and live for Jesus and have oil in your lamp now so you're ready when he comes and we'll talk about that. He said this, he said, They will deliver you to tribulation and kill you. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then will the end come. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the nations as a witness, and then shall the end come. Then verse 15 is very strategic. It says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, it says, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea, this is Jews, flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go back to take anything out of his house, let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. Woe to those that are pregnant and to those that are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter nor on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. Interesting things, and I, I'm not going to go into detail on this right now. This is something we can look at a little further down the line. For then there will be great tribulation. Then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world unto this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. 
and it follows on to the coming of the Son of Man in great power, and it tells us that no man knows the hour nor the day, and so on. And then we go into chapter 25 that talks about the foolish and wise virgins. That's another story in itself of those ready for his coming with oil in the lamps. That's a whole area in itself. So we have a broad statement about end times. It's just a very, here in chapter 24, it's a very broad picture. And a lot of people try to build their whole end time doctrine on the Olivet Discourse. I think that's a poor understanding of how we're supposed to do it. We've got to take all of the scripture. We've got to take the whole lot of the scriptures and look at them all uh, in order and have a look at them in sequence, how they tie together and build a doctrine of end times. I'd say to you, this is just an overview of a whole lot of things that are going to happen. The details can be found in the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, the, uh, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Zechariah, and so on. Uh, even the little book of Joel gives us great pictures of this great battle of Armageddon. Did you know there's coming a battle on the planet that is going to be so great that from Petra to Megiddo, the blood is going to run to the height of a horse's mane. It's talked about. That is a massive thing that's going to take place. A hundred and something, 180 or 170 miles where the blood runs to the height of a horse's mane. Major things in Revelation. Should we fear them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Will we see them? In my opinion, and I think biblically, and I want to show you where you stand, absolutely not. I really think this is going to take too long. If I start now into this area of Thessalonians, I think we're probably better to give it a whole session. I firstly want to say to you, don't fear anything. If you want to read on end times, go to the end of the book of Revelation. Read Revelation 19 with the coming of the Lord in power. Get a description of him there in Revelation chapter 19. Just let me, let me read this to you as I close out this session because I think we have to be very, very positive in every way about this study. Here's the scripture. It says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in white linen, white and clean, I believe that's you and I, are coming with him, followed him on white horses, clothed in white linen, white and clean on horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it, he should strike the nations and he himself will rule with a rod of iron. It's exciting. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Written on his thigh. In the ancient days when a person made a covenant, they would often cut into their thigh and rub thighs together as they cut a covenant and then mark it and leave a mark on their thigh. There's a mark on the coming king on his thigh that said, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We're kings under God. The Bible says he'll make us kings and priests under God. And he is the great king. And he has on his thigh your name in covenant. And I believe that you'll be coming with him when he comes in all of his power and all of his glory. But we're going to talk about that in the next episode. So look out for that. I'm going to open up, I think, one of the great studies on certainty and hope. So look forward to you joining us again. God bless.